Hello, my friend, and welcome to TFU News and Views. I am your host, Anthony Brucalli. I'm back, better than ever, live. Well, not really live, I guess. In the brand new TFU studios in sunny Orlando, Florida. And this special edition of TFU News and Views is all about Netflix's War for Cybertron Siege Part 2, Earthrise. Now, we are going to get a little little bit spoilery, but not too spoilery. This is a non-spoilery uh, review in the sense that I'm not going to give away any plot details. I'm not going to give away any episode details. Um, but I am going to give my thoughts on the season. Um, and some things may slip in here and there. So I just want to give you the warning as a heads up. That said, uh, the folks at Netflix were kind enough to allow me, uh, among a number of other Transformers media sites, to review the series and review the season. Uh, and the review, the spoiler episode, that will drop on the day the show drops, which is December 30th. This is dropping at midnight, well, 12.01 uh, a.m. on the 28th of December uh, Pacific time. So it's about 3 a.m. my time that this is going to uh, land in your laps. And uh, if you remember my thoughts and my non-spoilery review of War for Cybertron Siege, Netflix had given the media <laughs> all sorts of things we weren't allowed to talk about. Uh, I have to say, um, I won't be able to have fun with bleeping out all the things I am not allowed to talk about. Because in this review, the directions we were given were to not talk about any character deaths, not talk about episode six at all, and not talk about any character introductions. So it's a little easier for me to uh, tiptoe around some things here in this review of Earthrise. Now, if you hadn't checked out that episode, I'm going to give you some quick thoughts of mine about Siege. Now, you may have heard me talk about Siege in a number of places. Of course, here on TFU News and Views, I totally did a review of the series here. Um, I appeared on a couple of other podcasts. Most notably, I appeared on my friend Seth Everett's podcast, Hall of Justice. Go check that out. That was just recently, too. Episode number 212. You won't have to dial long distance, not 646. We're here, and I discussed the season. We prepped for this Earthrise season. We talked about the trailers. I also popped on a couple of other podcasts uh, to talk about the show, uh, Season 1, Transformers War for Cybertron Siege. And I'll give you my quick thoughts on that series overall. The story itself was pretty... It was pretty tight, but maybe a little bit too edited. So uh, some of the motivations didn't always make sense. Some of the plot devices came and went too quickly. Uh, but overall, the story was well told. Uh, but I did feel there was some lacking in creating emotional attachment. Uh, the voice acting was my big knock on the, sh on the show in that the voice acting itself, some of it was good, some of it was not. All of it was in this really slow cadence, so the voice direction was not very good. And a lot of the voices sounded the same. So watch the show, or I should say listen to the show without watching it, and tell me if you can tell the voices apart. Um, that is not always a good sign for me. And the last thing, uh, last knock I had on the first season was that it was constrained by its budget, which happens. Uh, I know it happens as a as a uh, producer, as a television producer, and as a uh, an editor. I know how a budget can can affect everything you do. And it, they here's the thing: the budget kind of takes away the essence of Transformers in some of this because it limited how much uh, they could do transforming and who could transform. So. With all that said, those are my knocks on, on the Siege season. That said, I liked it. I've watched it three times now, and each time I watched it more, I liked it a little less. It was a little bit dark for my taste. It was a little bit too much uh, DC Cinematic Universe for me. Uh, the comedy was um, not really there and where it was. Uh, I'll get into that a little bit more later, actually, because there's some things to talk about that with Earthrise as well. 
But as flawed as I saw it, I didn't think it was bad. I know some fans, some friends of mine really, really didn't like it. Um, I have other friends uh, who really did like it. Uh, I thought it was very middle of the road. Uh, It wasn't exceptional. It wouldn't be the first thing I would tell people to go watch to feel super entertained by Transformers. Um, You know, and as a producer, and and I want to delve into this a little bit because I think my friends who didn't like Siege, they're looking at it from an audience standpoint, which they should. I mean, they're the audience. They're spending their time. They should be entertained. Um, however, they look at it as a reflection back on the crew. And I always feel like that's a bit unfair. So as, as a producer, if you've seen my, my Twitter handle, it says three time Emmy award winning television producer and editor. And, uh, uh, I will always love having that title. Uh, but fact is, is that I won those Emmys as part of a team. Now I'm very proud of my Emmy award wins. Um, But my Emmys come in the realm of news and sports television. And it's a different beast than creating entertainment television. Now, no one, whether it's news and sports, whether it's entertainment, whether it's documentary, whether it is an infomercial, uh, no one sets out to make something bad. Uh, Bad, unless, unless really that's your goal. And if that's your goal, you're making something bad so that people can appreciate how bad it is. But no one sets out to make crap. Everyone sets out with the best intentions. And it's television is a team sport. Uh, <laughs> you have people that are good at what they do. You have people that are serviceable. Uh, you have people that are not good at what they do. But ultimately, it becomes a, a team game. and it becomes a budgetary game. It becomes a game of politics in some ways, but you're always creating something with the intent of it being good. Uh, in news and sports, I always refer to it as uh, paper towel television. Um, we go out there, we make something uh, that is good, but it is going to be thrown away once it is done. Now, the best you can hope for when creating uh, such a thing as paper towel television is that maybe you've made something a little better than a paper towel. Maybe you've made something that is more like um, a a good pair of socks or or a good undershirt, Uh, something that people aren't really going to see again, (laughs) but they might use once or twice or three or four times and use it to layer something uh, over it. So in news and sports, you hope that happens so that people build off of whatever story you've reported and build another story uh, off of that or use footage you've shot off of that. The entertainment world's a bit different. Uh, I, I can't say I've worked on much entertainment television, but I to follow this analogy, right, you're creating a product that is more in line with being a piece of clothing. And that's probably why I made the sock analogy a little earlier. Um, it's more in line with creating something that is meant to be worn over and over again. Not necessarily something fancy. It's not you're not making a tuxedo, right? That's that's the multi million dollar film. That is the the you know the one film Martin Scorsese does every few years. What you're looking to do is make a good t shirt, something people are going to watch over and over again, right? Like a good t shirt, you're going to wear it over and over again. You're going to wear it in different situations. You're going to find photos of yourself wearing it and remember why you were wearing it. I think in entertainment television, that's what people set out to do, and Sometimes you look back and you go, what was I thinking buying that shirt, right? (laughs) And sometimes you look back and go, man, that was a cool shirt. I wish I still fit into that thing. So I think from an audience perspective, there is a lack of insight into the process, into uh, making a good product, making that that thing that you're going to keep going back to the well for, right? And I think Siege Siege suffers from that a little bit in terms of its um, in terms of the audience reaction and in terms of how longtime Transformers fans viewed it. I think newer fans, casual fans, people that maybe know a little bit of the TV show and definitely know the '86 movie, they saw Siege as this great new thing. And long-term Transformers fans looked at it and went. Yeah, it's it's okay, but these are things we've known about and kind of 
uh, ruminated on for years or for a long time or been into for a while. And you're not giving us anything new. And maybe you're not giving us anything with any depth. Because there have been other stories told that have given this depth. And I know I'm, I'm on this rant here for about, I don't know, 10 minutes now about Siege. So I promise we are about to get into Earthrise. Now, if you are a casual Transformers fan or a fan of this Netflix series, you want to learn more about the Transformers series, I do want to just plug my regular podcast, Transformers University, right here. Give a listen to this promo. Want to learn a bit about the Transformers? Think you know everything about Cybertron, but are looking to learn a little bit more? Enroll today at Transformers University Podcast. Each episode will tackle a piece of Transformers history, starting in 1984 and marching our way up to today. Hosted by me, Anthony Brucali, three-time Emmy Award winner and consulting producer on Netflix's The Toys That Made Us, and lifelong Transformers fan, we'll go on a journey through cartoons and comics, toys and movies, and all the weird esoterica from around the world, chronicling the adventures of everyone's favorite, Robots in Disguise. Listen to Transformers University on iTunes, Google, Spotify, YouTube, and wherever you get your favorite podcasts. Transform and roll out! Now, one last thing before I get into Earthrise here. We're going to talk about the trailers, and anything that was in the trailers, I consider fair game. Okay, so if you haven't seen the trailers, here's your chance to pause to go on YouTube. If you're already on YouTube, search it out. There's two trailers, okay? Uh, and we'll talk about what's in them right now. I'm just going to give you another five seconds to punch out. So in five, four, three. All right, here we go. I didn't count the two and one. That's how we do it in television, <laughs> in a live setting. Uh, if you don't believe me, watch Wayne's World. All right, so let's talk about War for Cybertron Earthrise. Let's talk a little bit about what we did see in the trailers. Uh, you know, the first trailer featured the mercenaries. Uh, it featured hints at the Quintessons. And in that mercenary group, we saw Bug Bite, we saw Exhaust, we saw the Coneheads and Double Dealer. In the second trailer, we saw a little bit more of the Quintessons. We saw Galvatron. Uh, a very brief appearance by Unicron. And in both trailers, we saw a bit of some of the characters we met in the first season. So I want to make a quick note here. If you're listening to the podcast, I suggest you check out the YouTube channel. Now, if you're watching on YouTube, you've been noticing some still images from the season going by on your screen. Uh, Netflix also just released 145 images from the first two episodes. So with that in mind, the first portion of the video version of this episode, uh, I've taken care to only show uh, characters and scenes that weren't terribly spoilery for episodes one and two. Let's just say I'm going to try to go out of my way here uh, when I edit this to make it appear that those clips are from season one. Those still images you've seen in the first I don't know, 10, 15 minutes of this video side version uh, are all from season two. But now, as this goes on, I may not reference them directly in the audio side of this uh, because I'm really not allowed to, but Netflix released these images. So you can take a look at them and speculate all you want because there's some new faces in there and I want you to keep an eye on the screen as we talk. Now, this show starts out, it basically splits into two stories. So season one was more about the Autobots and the Decepticons. You basically had Optimus' story and then you had Megatron's story via Ultra Magnus, right? And how they were all kind of on this uh, colliding path to war. Season two splits into two stories. One story, is telling the fate of the Ark and its crew. Uh, and if you saw the trailer, uh, yes, the mercenaries are involved with that. And the second story follows the Autobot Rebellion on Cybertron. Now, 
I won't get into which episode is which, but that's basically the first two episodes. Um, and there's overlap. There's stories and episodes that focus on one more than the other, but still to kind of tell a little bit of both. But this series overall, and these six episodes overall, the one big improvement to the storytelling in Earthrise is that it's so much more episodic. Um, I can tell you that episode one is blah, right? And episode two, and I don't mean blah like it's bad. I mean that there X, Y, and Z happens in episode one, and that's the episode that's about this one thing. And episode two is the episode about this one thing. And episode three is the episode that this thing shows up or four is the episode where this person meets this person, right? Like, and, and I'm speaking in the abstract here, but, but that is the way the story is being told in Earthrise. And it's so much better. It's so much more fun to watch. It's so much more interesting to watch. And it's not to say that there isn't an overarching plot that catches up at the end because there is, there's a longer story that's being told, but it's being told in better pieces, which siege didn't seem to do. Siege felt like three hours of a movie that was just cut down to have things end at the half hour mark. And this doesn't do that. And that's what I like. These are kind of self-contained stories in a lot of ways. A um, couple of the episodes feel like, well, there's two episodes in the middle that feel like a two-parter, but you can kind of split them apart if you wanted to. Um, but even then, you feel like this is part one and this is part two. And yeah, there's there's one story here and there's a couple of smaller stories that kind of revolve around the bigger story. And that really goes to, I think, a change in the writing staff. Um, this time around, you only have two writers on the show, like, Last season one, you had um, you had four writers on the show, two of which were uh, the showrunners. So you had uh, uh, F.J. DeSanto uh, as taking on some writing duties as well as running the show. You had George Christick taking on some writing duties as well as writing running parts of the show. And then you had Brandon Easton and Gavin Hignett uh, as writers in addition on the show. Now, Gavin Hignite carries over, and Gavin Hignite uh, was also a writer on Transformers Cyberverse. There's a lot of Cyberverse feel uh, to Earthrise, and that is a good thing. That is a very good thing. And then Brandon Easton is out, and Tim Sheridan is in. And I am not familiar with Tim Sheridan's work, but if this is an example of his work, and he is going to be working on the Netflix Masters of the Universe series with Kevin Smith. I am really excited for that series because uh, between uh, Gavin's work and Tim Sheridan's work, this show really does move along nicely. Now, one of the key things I thought was wrong with Siege, and this goes to how the episodes were kind of plotted out, was the pacing, right? Um, the pacing definitely improves in Earthrise, though it doesn't improve right away. Episode one, episode two, they're good, but they are a little slow. They do drag uh, in the same way Siege does. Episodes three, four, and five really pick up the pace and really tell a nice, tight story. And then episode six, uh, I wouldn't say it was as strong as what I would like for a finale, but it wasn't bad in, in any stretch. It was, it was very good. But the pacing, uh, the balance of action and plot, were really well planned out for Earthrise. Now, the big negative on this season and on all the previous <laughs> episodes that have come before it is the voice acting. The voice acting, and I, I, I don't want to say bad acting uh, with one exception, uh, and I will point that out in a second. Um, it's not bad acting as much as it's bad directing. Uh, bad direction, again, um, Everyone speaks in this slow uh, monotone. Now, that is great for Megatron. I think uh, Jason Marnocha as Megatron is fantastic. He's His delivery is a little slow. Um, they really try to rumble up the bass in his voice, which 
It does work. It does work. Uh, Frank Dodaro as Starscream is is fantastic. The, again, his delivery is made to be slow uh, at times, and I don't think it works. Um, the elephant in the room here is uh, Jake Fauci as Optimus Prime. Uh, this is this is a mistake in casting. Uh, just looking at his his IMDb page and his credits, you know he's more known for being a voice. And 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 look, this isn't a knock on him. Uh, I think this is a bad casting job. And I think the bigger issue with the voices isn't so much the acting or the directing, but it's bad casting. And I'll explain why. So. Jake Fauci, from what I could see online, what I could learn about him, kind of made a name for himself as this young kid who could do this really deep uh, Don LaFontaine-esque uh, movie voice, right? This trailer voice. And he can do a pretty pretty good impression of Peter Cullen's movie Optimus Prime. Now, Peter Cullen's Michael Bay movie Optimus Prime is not his best performance as the character. It's not even close. Um, it's, he's a little bit drawn out. He's a little bit drawn slow and he lacks a lot of the emotional depth we got out of the G1 version, the, the original cartoon version. So with that in mind, then you take someone who does an impression of that and it's not necessarily acting. He's doing an impression of that and that's how you cast him. You find out the hard way that he can't stretch that impression to emote and to do acting. You know, voice actor Rob Paulson, who was uh, on the original Transformers series, uh, is best known for his work on Animaniacs and Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. Uh, he used to have this great podcast called uh, Talking Tunes with Rob Paulson. Uh, I suggest you check it out if you can find it still. Anyway, uh, he always said voice acting is uh, little v, big A, meaning the voice isn't as important as the acting ability. And it is really apparent here with Jake Fauci um, that he is a bit outside of his depth when he is asked to emote, when he is asked to yell, uh, when he's asked to command. Uh, it all becomes this garbled mess. It sounds like a kid in the backyard playing with his toys, uh, <laughs> which is fine if that's what you were going for. But if you're going for uh, what is one of the most iconic cartoon characters in the last 35 years, this is not what you want. And uh, I, I mean, I could sum it up harshly by saying uh, Transformers fans have gotten their equivalent to hating Christensen. And I hate to say that, but if there is any one big negative to this series, it is that. Now, as I mentioned, that is a flaw with casting, okay? Um, look, they're not casting SAG actors. They're not casting uh, union voice talent, which I'm not necessarily opposed to, but it comes with some risk. And it, it feels like Hasbro had Jake Fauci picked out right around the time they were picking up people for Hascom back in 2017 where they were relying on internet buzz on things like Chewbacca mom uh, to try to drive young eyeballs to their brands or to try to drive soccer moms to their brands. And I think it's a bad choice when you're talking about the key character in the biggest piece of your own intellectual property. And I'm not saying that it needs to be Peter Cullen. I mean, if you go through the history of people that have played Optimus Prime in just U.S. series alone. Gary Chalk, David Kay, Neil Kaplan, even John Bailey. Um, I really feel like they all could have done a better job than this. And that goes to say that it's not about the voice as much as it's about the acting. And again, that goes to the casting folks. Um, I think they've made a lot of mistakes in casting here. Um, not necessarily on the big folks, but and not even necessarily on the actors, but in the type of voice they're casting. And this goes back to my days working in uh, 
local cable 24 hour news. Um, you know, we, we would joke behind the scenes a bit that there was certainly a type of reporter that certain people would hire. Um, you know, uh, it was almost always a good looking white blonde woman, uh, in her mid twenties or early twenties that got hired on as a field reporter, uh, and then moved up into one of the midday anchor roles. Like just without a doubt, it would happen, um, periodically. And it was clear that the people that did the hiring had a type, right? Just like you have a type for who, uh, you might date or who you might be romantically interested in. I feel like that could apply to casting folks as well. So if you're casting for voices in the same way, then you're going to start choosing voice actors that all sound the same. And that is a big flaw of this entire series. Close your eyes and watch the show. (laughs) Okay, that makes no sense. Close your eyes and listen to the show. And tell me you can tell Bumblebee from Ironhide. Maybe. Tell me you can tell Barricade from Skytread or Spinister from Prowl. And I am deliberately going with characters from the first season. Chances are you can't. You can tell Starscream. You could probably tell Megatron, though Megatron sounds a lot like some of the other voices. Uh, You could definitely tell Optimus Prime. And that's about it. And that's because whoever was doing this casting clearly has a type and that is a problem if you go back to g1 to the original transformer series even at its silliest the level of talent in the voice actors look okay you knew when the voice was michael bell or casey Kasem. it pretty much sounded like michael bell or casey Kasem, or even peter cullen but peter cullen's optimus and peter cullen's ironhide sound fairly different from one another Frank Welker's voices as Megatron, as Trailbreaker, as Soundwave, as Skywarp all sound relatively different from each other, even as Rumble and Frenzy, right? Even some of the other, you know, voice actors that were in the industry forever. Don Messick, right? You know him as Scooby-Doo, the late Don Messick. You also probably know him as Papa Smurf, right? So that Papa Smurf voice was Gears change it a little bit and it's ratchet chris lotta the late chris lotta he was starscream and wheeljack and sparkplug and every one of those voices sounds different enough where you can close your eyes and know who's talking on top of it every one of those folks i just mentioned could act and act in those voices and that's where this show has failed um this is that's probably the big off-putting thing for a lot of people is the um The voice acting is just not there as far as variety, as far as acting ability, and as far as direction goes. Now, I appeared on another podcast that is also releasing at the same time as this one, and we got into a bit about dialogue, and I didn't really comment too much on it, but I actually really like some of the dialogue in this season. There are clearly references to Transformers the movie in some of the dialogue, but not in the way you would normally see it. And I like that. I really like that. No one drops a one shall stand, one shall fall in this, right? Um, There are other lines that you've heard in the 86 film that get reused in this series. And they're subtle and they're really well done. And while the acting isn't always there to deliver them, in a way that might trigger the fact that they're quoting the 1986 film, uh, it is really nice that the writers slipped those in. Now, speaking about the writing, and I know I mentioned comedy earlier, I did not like the comedy, and I say that in quotes, of Siege. The comedy in Siege, having seen it three times, and I missed a lot of the comedy early on because it wasn't that good. Um, It was very much at the expense of other characters. Um... For example, I think the best joke I heard in season one was Bumblebee calling Wheeljack flashy face, right? And it, it, that's what it was. It was all kind of like insult humor. Um, it was very lowbrow. And as someone who has had to write comedy, uh, oddly enough, in sports television, um, 
comedy is tricky. It's a tricky beast to work with. And I write comedy now a lot. I get asked to write comedy a lot in my current job uh, in corporate video, which is a whole other ballgame because you can't be too funny. So comedy has these weird kind of edges to it. Uh, You think it's easy and it's not. And when you're really good at it, people ask you to dial it back, especially if it's something like a kid's show, right? So this is not aimed to be too funny, nor is it aimed to be too raunchy. And I think the comedy here finds a nice balance. Um, Yeah, there's still a little bit of insult humor, which, um, look, it has its place. But when it's the only kind of humor, it, it, it loses its luster very quickly. The comedy in here every so often is more making light of the absurdity of some of the situations than it is of the person being absurd. And I think that is a really smart play by the writing staff. And I hope that continues into kingdom. For example, in the trailer, and I think this is a good example of the the comedy difference, right? So as I mentioned, right, there's the, the flashy face joke in season one in this season, right? In the trailer, there's a, there's a great shot of, um, jet fire as an Autobot doing something and something good, right? I can't really remember what it is, but, (laughs) And Red Alert uh, exclaims, I love having an Autobot who can fly. Now, that's funny because it's funny about the situation. They know they don't have this one thing, and he is the one anomaly in that. And Red Alert being so excited about that creates humor. And those are the kind of jokes you have in here. You also have like the get the ugly one uh, for Bumblebee. Uh, with the quintessons uh, that's in the trailer. And that's, that's, that's a little more insult humor, but it's also really funny because it's bug bite bringing him over. So th- th- there's, there's a little bit of, of, of um, absurdity, even in that comment. So big, big props to the writing staff for improving the comedy in this, ep- in this season. Now, one of the other knocks I had on the first season was uh, the amount of body horror. I mean, uh, you know, the inside of the arc was like hallways of dismembered Autobots all over the place. Uh, They're just extra parts laying all over the place. And they really dialed that down uh, in Earthrise and to good effect because the times it does happen, there's one moment uh, in one of the first two episodes that it's really in there and it's really horrific. And it feels horrific. And it's it's really good in that way. And, you know, with how much body horror there was in Siege, you think I would have more to say about it? But that's about it. Um, there's only a couple times. There may only be that one time. Uh, nope, I'm wrong about that. There, um, It's only a couple of times in the season where there there's something. But it's, it's not, you know, poor Moonracer getting torn apart by zombies. Now, lastly, you're probably wondering about characters. I can't talk about what characters show up. I can't talk about if there are surprises. I will tell you there are new characters. There are old characters uh, that we didn't think we'd see again that we'll see again. And there are spotlights given to some characters in this season that really make you appreciate them. Um, I won't say who, but it's not it's not your main cast. It's not your 84 guys. It's your characters that were kind of pulled into this. Uh, they get certain roles in, in parts of the series that really make you appreciate them and really make you like them, which is huge to me. Um, as a fan, I always want the show to kind of make me see the thing, want the thing. And uh, as a toy collector, now it's see the thing, appreciate the thing that you already have. Um, and it's made me appreciate uh, a couple of the characters so much more than when they were either, uh, you know, characters in the background or characters that were, yeah, they made a toy of that, so they had to put it in the show somewhere. Um, and that's for Autobots and Decepticons um, and, and maybe even some of the mercenaries. It, it, it's really made me appreciate some of the characters some more. And I think that is the key. This is why Earthrise is uh, so much better than Siege was. I always say that, you know, you can kind of compare Transformers as blah, 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 fill in the blank. Um, I say Siege was Transformers as a DCCU movie. 
I would say, you know, the old IDW books uh, when they did the the phase two split. Robots in Disguise was Transformers as a Star Wars prequel. And uh, Lost Light was Transformers as Star Trek The Next Generation. I feel like this really heavily leans towards Transformers as a Star Trek series. And um, that is really where Transformers works best. Where it's it's not bound to one place. It's not bound to one planet. Uh, it's not bound to the trappings of being robots in disguise. Uh, because the budget on the show cannot let them be robots in disguise. And I think this was a smart way to write around it. And finally, for long-term fans, um, there is a lot of fan service, <laughs> a lot of fan service in uh, this series. You know, it's funny. I think I said on Hall of Justice when we were talking about Siege, it's almost like Transformers lore for dummies. And I feel like they've carried this on into Earthrise. Um, there's a lot of references to various things various things in the history of the brand and that's not just g1 um, there are clearly references to idw comics um, there are clearly references to marvel uk there are clearly references to uh, things introduced in beast wars there are clearly parallels to things introduced in beast machines um, and things introduced in beast machines the all spark was introduced uh, in Beast Machines, right? Um, there are clearly references to some other things, actually. Now I'm thinking about it. There are, there are references to uh, more than one thing uh, introduced in Beast Wars. There are things introduced here um, that kind of date back to Transformers Armada. Um, there, there's a little bit of, of a lot of things in here. And that's good. That's good. Um, it's fan servicey in a lot of ways. But, you know, pull yourself out of it for a minute if you're a long-term fan. And think about how this impacts to the general fan watching it. Um, it creates a depth and a lore here that they may not know about and makes them interested in the brand. And I always think that is a good thing. It's almost like the approach to this was the mindset the Transformers brand team had back in 2010 when they created the quote-unquote aligned continuity. This is starting to feel more like the intent of the old aligned continuity as opposed to what the outcome of the old aligned continuity was. And if you don't know what the aligned continuity is, don't worry. Um, it, uh, it's almost better you don't know. But if you do know what it is, then what I just said probably makes sense. Now, finally, I'm not allowed to talk about the final episode. I'm not allowed to talk about where things end yet. I will tell you, the last scene only thing I will say about the final scene is if you know me, if you are a friend of mine, or if you know my tastes, I cannot watch that last scene. I've watched the season twice now um, and not smile like an idiot. Um, it is it, it hits the mark so well. Actually, the last scene of that episode and the last scene of the second to last episode, episode five, both of them hit the mark so well. And in fact, I do want to say episode five, without giving anything away about episode five, is my favorite episode of the whole um, 12 episode run so far. Um, and I do feel it is, it may be one of the best single Transformers episodes in a very, very long time. And I won't say anything more about it than that. Um, yes, I know I'm probably spoiling you by setting your expectations, but too bad. I need to gush about that episode a little bit. But yes, the final scene, I just watched it before I started recording. And yeah, it hits it hits the mark. I, I walked away smiling and I was still smiling five minutes later because I know what's coming or at least I have a sense of what's coming just by that scene. And I am very, very happy. So there you have it. My thoughts on the upcoming Transformers War for Cybertron Earthrise series on Netflix. Once again, I want to thank the folks at Netflix for allowing me to see this show early. I've had it basically for the last two weeks and I've only been able to watch through it twice because of the holidays. But uh, 
I am very thankful to the folks over at Netflix for uh, hooking us up with that and hooking us up with these awesome promotional images that you are seeing if you're watching this on YouTube. I also uh, want to just let you know a bit about tfu.info. If you are new uh, to this site, this podcast, and uh, this YouTube channel, uh, tfu.info is the longest running Transforming Toy Archive on the web. I catalog the entire history of the Transformers brand in toy form. Uh, we we break down characters uh, by character, by toy uh, mold, and by name use. We also have all of the uh, parts and handy-dandy identification guide by uh, vehicle mode and color. So if you have a red car, you can search through all the red cars until you find the one that you have. I also host Transformers University podcast, which you can find wherever you listen to podcasts. You can also find it here on YouTube and on my YouTube channel, youtube.com slash T-F-U-I-N-F-O, T-F-U info. And finally, you can catch me usually on Twitter uh, at T-F-U underscore info, but you can also catch us on Facebook at facebook.com slash T-F-U info, Instagram.com slash T-F-U info, and of course on the web at www.tfu.info. So please come on by, check out the site, check out the Twitter handle. More importantly, please check out Transformers University podcast. I have so much fun doing it. Uh, episode 96, I think, 95 or 96. I forgot where I left off. It's It's been a bit busy with my move uh, down to Orlando, Florida. But episode uh, 96 is on the way. We're inching up to episode 100. We've covered almost all of the G1 cartoon, uh, a ton of the Marvel US and UK comics, uh, all the toys through uh, 1987, and uh, we have so much more to talk about. We have 35 plus years of history to go through 36, going on 37 in a row years of history to talk about. So what a time to hop on board your home. Uh, you might be uh, quarantining. You might be um, self-isolating, or you might just be working from home. Uh, here's your chance to listen to a great and informative and fun podcast that I put together and invite all of my uh, podcasting friends on to come on and talk and find out what they love about this brand. So if you love this brand, if you love uh, just taking this journey with the Netflix series, then please join me on Transformers University. That just about does it. Once again, I am Anthony Bricali, owner, operator, madman behind TFU.info. Until next time, see ya. Hey, want to help out this podcast or the website TFU.info? There's a number of ways you can do it. Let me tell you how. You can help us directly by joining our Patreon and enrolling as a student at Transformers University. There, you'll get early access to the podcast as well as exclusive behind-the-scenes peaks and perks for as little as $1 a month. Sign up is quick and easy. Just swing on by to www.patreon.com slash TFU info. Another way you can help us is by using our Amazon link, www.tfu.info slash Amazon. Type that into your browser whenever you want to shop at Amazon and a portion of what you spend will be contributed back to us. It's that easy. Finally, you don't become the world's longest running transforming toy archive without some help from other fans. We're always on the hunt for photos of figures and accessories we're missing from our pages. If you'd like to contribute, go to tfu.info slash help for a list of what we need or send an email to info at tfu.info. tfu.info, the Alpha Trion and Omega Prime of Transforming Toys. Now, back to the show.